Hi, I'm Brian. Welcome to Autogafool. As you can imagine, we get quite a lot of cars to try. Some of those we look forward to a little bit more than others. Well, might come as news, but I have been very excited to try out this particular car. This is the Toyota Hilux. Now, I last owned one of these in 2000, and I put 74,000 miles on that in one year. What do I remember from that experience? Well, mostly that the car made absolutely no sense back then to drive on the road. But once you took it into a field, well, then things really started to change. Well, I'm personally hoping that the comfort and the drive experience has come on quite a bit since then. I'm here with Jonas just outside of Munich and we've managed to get lost in the woods in order to show you some of what this car can really deliver. Lots of cars have the words off-road in their title these days, but as I'm sure you'll be aware, they don't always mean it. Well, this really does. So this is not a brand new release, but it is a brand new line. This is the executive line, which is new to the Hilux range. We're gonna take a closer look, find out what's different about it. Does it justify its slightly higher price tag? And is it still just as much fun to drive through a field? Let's take a closer look. Please forgive me if it looks a little bit funny, me walking around the car in the snow. We did talk about whether that was a bit too much or not, but what's really important to us is to bring you videos of how these cars actually function. So it's authentic. We found this spot by ourselves and yes, we were extremely careful to check. We were allowed to drive here before you guys mentioned that a lot of the area is protected. Now, the executive line hasn't blown everything away with its new ideas, but certain things have changed. As you can see, the styling here with the headlamps and the whole front face of this car has been somewhat reimagined. Now, these lights are gonna come standard as halogen, but you can have them now optional as LED. As you can see, it's a lot more bulky and angular than we're used to seeing traditionally. Now, although that's not immediately obviously aimed towards customers who are liking a more American design. You can certainly see the visual reference cues here being given off. And I think that's because in a very competitive market against a very tough competition, what Toyota are trying to do is to make this car more stylish. We know what its off-roading credentials are, but you're gonna to wanna to drive it around town from time to time. And I think it's nice to see some efforts been made to just make it look a little bit more stylish. At 5 meters 33 or 210 inches in length, the side profile of the Hilux remains unchanged. And I don't think that there's a huge reason to change this. It's quite popular, people like it. You're either going to be into pickups or you're not. Now, this is a really important choice to make if you're going to go with a Hilux because it's going to dictate how much ground clearance you have. Now, obviously, the compromise and the choice to be made here is that the higher the ground clearance, the more of this type of stuff you're going to be able to do. But for most people, even agricultural users of this vehicle, they're still going to want to take this car on the road quite a lot. So I would suggest that big is good, but not too big. What's nice about these wheels is they should be giving us a pretty decent balance between realistic off-road usage, and I think this is, or still a comfortable highway drive. We're going to get the chance to take this out and find out if it can deliver that famously important best of both worlds. But meanwhile, I think aesthetically, this is a nice compromise. They're big enough to show you it means business, but not too big to look rather unwieldy outside a school pickup point. Round to the back now in my wholly inappropriate footwear, and this is where this starts looking like a serious contender for your off-road vehicle of choice. This has a towing capacity of 3.2 tons. 
I think that's more than enough for most people. The back of the car, again, nothing has changed back here from the standard line, and this styling, I think, is still an awful lot more modern than a lot of the generations that went before it. It looks pretty user-friendly. I like the rugged nature of these steps. And here we have a bed liner. Now, the cab itself is available in three different styles. You can have the standard two if you need a lot of storage back here, or you can have the extended cab. That gives you just a bench seat and a little extra room behind the driver and the passenger. Or as we have here, the full double cab. So in theory, you can fit four people in in perfect comfort and you still have a very decent load space in the rear. So talking about the back, let's take a closer look. Now, if you haven't owned or used the Hilux before, you might be a little bit unfamiliar with how they're put together. First of all, solidly, but second, they don't make you feel like they have a million whistles and bells because they are here for use. And that means that they're very ruggedly designed. If you have a look at the rear of this section, you can fit a load length just about 58 inches or 147 centimeters in the back. This is the double cab and the width that we have available to us for loading in is around about 50, 52 or 132 centimeters. Now, this is a simple question. It really depends on exactly what you need to fit in the rear as to what size of cab you're gonna go with. My Hilux, that was just a two up front because I wanted as much space in the back as I could possibly get. And I never regretted that decision. Yeah, you couldn't take passengers, but I had load a lot more times than I had passengers. And somehow it felt like a more real off-road truck that way. I really enjoyed it. But it depends on what your needs are. Nothing about this has been designed to feel as if it's there just for appearance. It's all nice and solid. And if you haven't had the opportunity to need to take one of these fully loaded through a field, well, I can assure you, it does what you need it to when you need it to do it. One of the things I've always liked about the Hilux is it stands with the statement that if it isn't broken, there's no need to fix it. So this is entirely designed to go off-road and look at that. Even in this day and age, we still have a rigid fixed axle and leaf spring suspension. Why? Because it just works. On top of the new front end, we have a new interior for the executive line as well. Has it hit all the right spots? Let's take a closer look and find out. Well, let's start off with the key. That's a relatively nondescript affair, but it's nice enough. Now, once we get in, we can see that there has been quite a lot changed here by way of styling. This is the new black interior. So the point is to make it feel a little bit more sophisticated. Let's hop in and see how it feels. Okay, well, the first and most obvious thing to point out is that a Hilux is a Hilux, and you can dress it up any way that you want, but you're still going to be experiencing quite a lot of plastic feeling throughout. So you really have to have your expectations set to the right place before you get in this vehicle. What do I mean by that? Well, this is a utility vehicle, so I expect it to be properly covered in mud, little straw in the back, and possibly stuff everywhere. So it needs to be easy to clean and everything about the design needs to communicate that to you. So although you could take a look and say, well, for the executive line, there is a lot of plastic here. I have to tell you, plastic is by far and away the easiest surface to clean. And if I'm out in the most awful storm ever, trying to get a sheep out of a ditch, I'm not really wanting to think about how much luxury I'm sitting in and covering in that mud. So. Once we take a look at the rest of the interior, we'll see how this all ties together. 
Well, I don't know if you had the opportunity to view our review of the Land Cruiser last year, but I have to tell you a lot of my thoughts and sentiments about that have come straight through into this car. I love the Hilux. I think it is a fantastic pickup, but what it isn't is a luxury vehicle. And I don't think there's anything in here that's trying to convince you otherwise. It's just that when you buy a base model of this car, you don't mind about all of the plastic and about the really utilitarian feeling. That is a 1980s digital display. But then again, it does the job. So the styling here, I don't think is going to win any particular awards for either originality or panache. But I really do appreciate that Toyota have gone to the effort to try and make it a little bit more sophisticated. Because if you have spent your life driving around in utility vehicles, it's nice to feel that you're not being ignored. And this certainly does up the game a little bit. I'm really not a fan of this. I would much rather have a basic stereo system. I have my phone if I want to get connected. Now, we have tried to utilize this in our navigating. The system is a little bit on the clunky side. These buttons are really less than awesome to use. It's not intuitive. And to my way of thinking, it doesn't present particularly nicely within the dashboard. Surrounded as it is by this piano black plastic, topped off by this digital clock, this to me looks like a very dated display. So honestly, my feeling is they could have done better with this. But that is just my taste. Once we start getting a bit lower, I start getting a bit happier. These controls for the heating and cooling are very nicely laid out, very straightforward and very easy to use. Over here, we have the selector for the all-wheel drive system. Now, this is actually very straightforward and simple and it's very nicely placed. Thank you, Toyota. That is something I need easy access to and bang, there it is right where I need it to be. Lower down, we have lots of the selections available to us. This is the rear diff lock, this is the downhill assist, and this is the all important traction control off button for having extra fun. Now, the problems I have with these buttons are not their placement or their functioning. I just would either like for them to push in so I can get that tactile feeling that yes, that's engaged or yes, it's off. Now you do get that information through the dashboard. I just like that being resonated through here. I would quite like it if the individual buttons lit up to tell me that they're actually activated. They do not. So it is a little bit of getting used to the system. That said, once you're used to it, it's much, much easier because you do have the information on the dashboard. Here we have heated rear seats and here we have what to me is a little bit of a clumsy rubber flap over the USB import. We have two 12 volt charge points, one for passenger, one for driver. So obviously a wide variety of things that you can put in there. Permanent cup holders here, a nice good utility tray located here. This gear stick, whilst being fairly basic, does a nice job. In an off-road vehicle, you just want to be able to slam that where you need it and have it feel good and solid and connected, and it is. And you know what? I find this quite appealing. In a world with a thousand buttons down here, look at what we have. An eco mode button and a power mode button. If you push them twice, then you go through selecting them to selecting nothing at all, which means the standard mode is the default. And that's a little bit of a relief after having 400 modes to pick on a car. After all, you always know, what do I want? Standard or to be more economic or come on, give me the power. And this gives you that option. Extra storage back here. Hooray! Somewhere properly sized, I can put my key that's not going to interfere with my phone. And then, I'm not sure if Jonas can capture from that angle. Maybe it's a little bit too harsh, but we have a really nice size storage bin with a proper full-size plug point in there and that is very handy indeed. So comfort. Well I'm going to give you a thumb up here. One thumb Toyota. I am comfortable in these seats. They're not bad at all but although um, they give you as much hold as you would want and they are comfortable for road use and yes I will give you they're a nice compromise between what you want off-road and what you need for comfort on. For an executive line, I just could have used a bit more support, a bit more structure. 
I think that could be a little bit of a harsh criticism. Really keen to hear what you think if you try out these seats versus their standard brothers. Cockpit layout. Well, the steering wheel controls are not fabulous. I don't think Toyota have quite got there yet. There is a little bit more work to be done here. They're not quite as intuitive as they could be. And the digital display in the center really is a bit of a cluttered mess, if I'm being completely honest. It does give you rather a lot of information, but cycling through it to find exactly what you want just isn't quite as intuitive as you might like. But please remember the type of vehicle this is. That is nothing damning of this vehicle because it's almost entirely irrelevant to how you're going to use it. And if you're going to put nearly as many miles onto this thing as I did on mine, in no time at all, you'll be comfortable knowing where everything you actually want to access is. And in a way, it makes you feel a bit special that you're the only person who knows how to find it. These controls are nicely laid out and they're very well positioned. I've always been a fan of the way that Toyota has managed their stalks. I find them very intuitive, very straightforward and very easy to control. The same goes for the cruise control function down here. So the actual action of driving this car is very straightforward and actually really rather enjoyable. Other than that, I think really it comes down to how you feel about plastic. In this car, I really don't mind about it at all. It's just that if I'm being completely honest, I'm just not finding enough of a reason as to why I would want to spend the extra to get the executive line over the more basic models. So now we're gonna try something a little bit unusual for us. This is Jonas, a beautiful cameraman, and he is illustrating how regular human beings interact with this car. Jonas, how tall are you? Uh, one meter and 93. 1 meter and 93. Now take a look at Jonas' legs. He I does not it. have I put it out to the back. He does not have a huge amount of legroom there and that is as far back as that chair will go. So I really wanted you to be able to have a good look at that. It's fine. He is comfortable, but I'm not sure how long I could get him to stay in that position. Well, now let's take a look in the back and see just how usable this rear space is. Well, First thing to point out, I'm five feet 10 or 178 centimeters. That is not particularly tall. I do have a long torso. I have just enough headroom here. So yeah, I'm gonna be able to drive around in here, but I'm not gonna be the most comfortable. The seats are very upright, which of course is to make the most of this limited space available. Now, haha, Thomas, one in the eye for people with long legs. Finally, we can build somewhere that's been built for us if we have short legs. Now, this space back here, oh, get that fancy slide down clip for my handbag. I have plenty of space back here, but this is a big but. This is the driver's seat and it is set for me to use and I have very short legs. Now, we just showed you what it was like for Jonas in the front. Can you imagine Jonas sitting in the back if he had a Jonas identical twin in the front? It's just not really going to work. You know, it's okay for me, but I think realistically, the back of this car is 100% fine for short trips, or even if you're using this for getting people to and from work locations, as a film vehicle, it's actually fine because you have all this great storage behind you. So in terms of what it is, a double cab pickup, I'm actually pretty happy. There's a good amount of room back here. Jonas is not necessarily nodding his head in agreement, but the other thing that I'm pleasantly surprised with is how much I like the finishing back here. Whilst I felt that it wasn't great in the front, in the back, I actually feel that I'm in quite a bit of comfort here. I felt that I have been considered. And as I said, if you really think about what this competes with, with this segment in general, it's nicely finished. So well done, Toyota, pretty good. Let's take a look and see what's powering this thing. All right, I've lost the bonnet catch. There we go. Well, I have to say, given the weight of this bonnet, it might have been nice if we had some kind of gas strut, but that'll do the job. Okay, what you are looking at is the 2.4 litre diesel. And I'm pretty certain this is gonna sell hand over fist over the other available options. But to start with, we've got the 2.4, we have a 2.8 litre diesel, 
we have a 2.7 litre petrol or the top of the line is a 4 litre 6 cylinder petrol. So that's the big beast. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't look as if we're going to get a really big diesel monster. Toyota are pretty tight-lipped about that at the moment, but I really don't think it's happening. It depends on your application, but at 3.2 tonnes, and bearing in mind that's only because of the regulations. If you happen to live in Switzerland, apparently you can go all the way up to four with this thing. The 2.4 litre diesel is going to be my pick of the crop. It's plenty enough power. It's very nicely behaved. The fuel efficiency is not bad at all. And I'm pretty sure it's what made this vehicle famous. So, as you can see, we've got rather a lot of space left in here. So maybe if we do enough convincing, Toyota might give us that big diesel beast after all. Simply put, the single best thing about owning a Hilux is that you can take it places that you simply wouldn't go with a different vehicle. Now, back in my day, that was quite a lot of faffing around. I actually had two sticks in the central console to select the different modes, and if I wanted four-wheel drive, I had to get out and operate manual diff locks on both of the front wheels. Well, times change and things move on. And in this situation, everything is managed electronically. So, standardly, if you're driving on the highway, you're going to be using H2. That just gives you two-wheel drive, it saves a lot of fuel, and to be honest, it's the most comfortable driving experience you can have in the car. But once you start to get in a somewhat more challenging environment, you have two options awaiting you. H4, any standard users of off-roaders will know, means that you get full power four-wheel drive, and you also have L4, and that's going to give you lower revs more control of those wheels and that's great for really really sticky situations where you think you might be coming a little bit undone now i'm going to start off here in h4 there's no reason to need those extra low revs but i can tell you we're not getting out of here with two-wheel drive so jonas are you feeling brave yeah he doesn't look entirely brave i have to tell you <laughs> he, he looks somewhat convinced after all we did get in here in the first place obviously you're going to want to go with low revs. That ground clearance is just great. And even being able to take a look up the path that we came in, I really can't think of a standard production car that I would bring down here, obviously enough. But the Hilux handles it like it's absolutely just going for a regular Sunday afternoon drive. And it's a really reassuring feeling because as much as you might think you don't often have a personal need for off-road, I have to admit to being a little bit biased towards the new trend of producing SUVs that are described as off-road but aren't. I like a car that says it's off-road and really means it. Now, I think I can demonstrate by the almost complete lack of need I've had to concentrate that that's exactly what we're achieving. There is a fairly large tree stump in my way at the moment, which we've already been through, and absolutely no problem for us whatsoever. Nice bit of an incline, straight onto an extremely icy road, no bother whatsoever. Now, one of the places that off-wheel, uh, off-wheel, off-road drivers sometimes come unstuck is they think because they have all that extra traction, that means that they don't have to worry about sliding off the road. Not true. Let me show you this. Now that's actually quite impressive, that's the anti-lock brakes and I can tell you that because of vehicle use on this road we're more or less driving on straight up ice. We know this because a couple of times we've gotten out to film Jonas and I have nearly come to a bad conclusion but the car is very comfortable. It's so important to remember that any time that you're not driving in a straight line <laughs> your car, because it's not light, can just start moving sideways. So even though, I'm not sure if you can see it in this shot, we have a good quarter mile of dead straight road. I would always suggest that you never drive too quickly, as much fun as that might seem, because once they start sliding, it's very, very difficult to get back control before you're in the snow. And a good rule to follow with snow driving, 
is if you can't see underneath it, you don't know what's there. And anyone who's ever taken out something in deep snow in winter will know exactly what I'm talking about. One of the really interesting things about the Hilux is just how distinctive the experience is. It's a long time since I last sat in one, but the engine note and the feeling of the steering and the handling right the way through to how this car interacts with its environment is almost unmistakable. It's actually really a pleasant experience to drive one of these, but only if you know you're gonna drive it for the purpose that it was being built for. So, what do I mean by that? Well, the road position is great. I'm up high and unlike some other SUVs, everything feels really solidly built. So I feel very confident here. I'm perfectly happy at any point just leaving the road behind and going for a drive through the trees. But at the same time, it's surprising how refined the experience of comfort has gotten in these cars. Back when I had mine, it was a real bone shaker it was great, it did the job it needed to do, but you certainly weren't ever going to tell anyone you felt comfortable in it. Well, thankfully, the seats and the driving experience have massively improved since then. So driving through here actually feels remarkably comfortable. Jonas, would you say that that's fair? Totally comfortable. And Jonas should know, he's driven in enough cars while reviewing footage in order to have a fair assessment. Well, in just a minute, we're gonna run out of lovely forest scenery, and then we're gonna have the chance to take this car on the road. Now, there really is no need to have it in four wheel drive when you are just cruising on the highway, and it's only gonna cost you more in fuel use and obviously tires if you drive that way. But it's nice to remember that you have the option if you want to take it off. we pull out you immediately get a demonstration of exactly how effective that four-wheel drive was just taking it back into the regular two-wheel drive and in this car that power is coming from the rear and you immediately get a little bit of that slip on the snow but it's very easy to see which mode you're in there's a lovely green indicator that comes up straight up on the dashboard as you enter four-wheel drive so it's not one of those things you can put on and forget about it though I have to tell you one of the things that's changed in terms of how the Hilux behaves through the generation is that it used to be when you had this car in four wheel drive, you really knew you had it in four wheel drive. That process has been refined to such an extent that other than a subtle difference in how the vehicle feels and handles, it's very, very comfortable in four wheel drive now. And that's nice because if you experience a situation where you just wanna have it on for your own peace of mind, it's not gonna impact on your driving. So, things that are still the same? Well, the engine note, it's almost unmistakable. It sounds a little agricultural. It is, of course, a diesel in this car. Ah, there's something that really charms me about it, but I guess I'm a bit odd that way. Now, the cabin noise has been significantly improved through the years. So if you're used to chugging along in one of these, having to shout at your passenger, you do not have to do that anymore. As far as all the bells and whistles on this car are concerned, well, I would liken the experience a little bit to how you interact with technology when you're driving a performance car. What do I mean by that? I mean that I don't care at all about any of this, really. I just want to experience the drive of the car. So this attempt to freshen things up and add digital systems in here, to be honest, I find a little bit unnecessary. I'm sure that people will be requiring this and that's why they have to put it into the vehicle. But because it's not quite premium in terms of how it's present, its driver experience or what it adds to your experience is really nothing that's going to blow you away or change your perception about this car. It's all about the drive. If you've never had a pickup before, it's really a very simple equation. Do you need to go off-road? If the answer is no, you're less likely to want one. Do you need to tow heavy things? Or do you need the load space in the back? If the answer to all three of those questions is no, there is literally no reason for you to own a pickup truck. I know they're popular, I know people like the styling, 
but really guys there are much better options available for you if you're going to be doing most of your driving on the road what this car excels at is being driven through the middle of swamps so if that sounds like something you're going to need to do or towing things where they regularly are going to have to go on grassy areas you need a lot of power and a lot of good torque for that job too then you should think about one of these if you've already owned a pickup and you know what you're doing with a four-wheel drive car well for me it's a question of how much you want to spend and how much comfort you want for me the Hilux has always been something of an agricultural vehicle it's not the fanciest it doesn't have all of the bells and whistles and even with this executive line I still don't have the feeling that I'm sitting in a premium product but the pricing reflects that so I'm happy and what's most important to me is that I get the tool that does the job I need it to. That is absolutely something that you experience from sitting in this car. It just feels solid, well-made. The engine gives you the power that you want. And look, we're driving around town now. What has significantly changed with this vehicle is that I feel comfortable doing that. It doesn't feel out of place or strange. The road position is nice for in-town driving as much as off-road driving and it feels a little bit like driving something that's rugged and strong and capable of taking anything you can throw at it. Only downside to town driving? Well, if you're used to driving smaller cars, you'll be aware that very quickly you get a sense of the size and space that the car takes up on the road. It takes a lot longer in a pickup truck and a lot of that is because of that huge ground clearance. So it takes a while to adjust in those smaller streets with more cars and vehicles running around you but once you get used to it it's no different to anything else you've ever driven so gearbox very nice actually very refined you can have your choice of manual or going with as this one has the automatic the automatic gearbox is so good now i see no need or benefit in going with the manual they've had years to perfect the way that this interacts with the car and it's really good so too is the pickup in the pickup so okay it's never going to blow your mind in terms of acceleration but we do have two driving modes much to jonas and my surprise well three if you include the no driving mode select option there's an eco button well i don't know how much time you're going to spend pushing that but it's actually nice to know that it's there and there is a power mode what does the power mode do well, it just means that you stop losing any concern about how much petrol you might be burning through while you're on your way from A to B. But realistically, we've now had this car going throughout some pretty extensive woodland, some nice bits of off-roading, and we're still only pulling in at 10.6 litres per 100 kilometres driven, which I think is actually a pretty decent fuel economy for a car of this size profile and the driving we've been doing it with it. What do you think? Is that what you'd expect? Or do you want even more? So can you get any realistic acceleration out of a Hilux? Well, let's pop it in power mode and find out. And that's 80. You know what, it's a pickup. I really think that that's more than enough. The engine is particularly interesting to listen to always in these vehicles when you put your foot down. So is it the most glamorous off-roader? No, clearly not. Is it the most fancy off-roader? No, definitely not. Is it the most practical off-roader? I think there's a very strong case to put for a yes. It just does what you need it to. It's not going to draw lots of admiring glances when you drive it through a crowd of younger people, but you know who it will impress, and that's anyone who's stuck in the field that needs to get pulled out by you. And you know what? That's not bad. Come to an off-road circuit just outside of Munich and regular viewers might remember us bringing the Toyota Land Cruiser here last year to try it out. Well, you may 
have a similar feeling to us, which is that sometimes we're a little bit cagey about manufacturers' off-road circuits because they have been designed really to show off all of the best aspects of the cars. However, I can tell you because we've been here before and in this car, that really isn't the case. All they've done is they've isolated various different parts of what is quite an extensive off-road circuit in order to show you the individual features of the car. A, really, a Land Cruiser, but especially a Hilux, should be able to go more or less anywhere that you want it to go. Now, I'm gonna stop and put this in four-wheel drive on low in order to make sure that we've got the traction that we need. The first bit of the course that we're gonna to come to is the axle twist. You will be very familiar with seeing this on more or less any off-road circuit. And this isn't particularly dramatic, but what's really nice to see is that whereas you could go in many cars for whom you'd be hearing the creaking and straining, this is nothing for the Hilux at all. This is everyday bread and butter. So your driveway might get that bad at some point in winter. And if it does, this is gonna be the car that you want. Now, if you just picked up that little bit of ground noise as we're driving along, we did ask. This comes standard with plastic under ride protection, which is really more than most people could ever want. Obviously, you keep a regular check on that. If it becomes damaged, then you're gonna be able to change it. Nice steep hill coming up. We've got snow and ice at the top, but that's no problem at all. Um, that way, if you want to have something different, you can get it from a third party manufacturer. But honestly, for most people, the plastic stuff does more than f anything you need it to. It just keeps you safe in case you do go over something that scrapes up along the underside. So that was a little bit of a steep hill. Again, nothing very challenging. It's got a bit more of a curve coming up here. Now we did have a guide to show us around and he showed us all the angles that we're supposed to be taking. So hopefully, oh, do you know what? I really hoped I was gonna do that in one. Sorry, I did my best. We're gonna to need to take a little second pass at that though. Here we go. The turning circle is not bad on this car, but obviously for the huge external size of it, you wouldn't expect it to be perfect. It is surprisingly nimble, however, and the steering feels nicely responsive. So I'm gonna come around to the right here and a little bit of flat track. So you can see it transitions in a really straightforward way between challenging driving and just regular driving. So we're gonna come up on a feature in just a second, which is included within this car, and that is the downhill assist. One of the things that we've heard today that makes a lot of sense is that most people who enjoy riding off-road, and I'm certainly one of those, prefer to have as much control of the vehicle as they can possibly experience because it feels much more exciting that way. So what's the value of downhill assist? Well, it's very simple. When you apply your foot to the brake, that's what you're doing. You're braking. It's applying the brakes of the car. If you use the downhill assist, it can electronically determine which of those brakes it wants to apply at any point. So you have a lot more happening. Now, the only way that I know that it's on is I have a little green logo right in the middle of my dashboard, and that allows me to take my foot completely off the accelerator, completely off the brake, and the car is now doing all the work. So standardly, you really don't need this as a feature. But if you do live somewhere with particularly steep, icy hills, this can quite literally be a lifesaver. So don't discount it just because you really enjoy living without one. Well, we have a fair bit of snow and ice here today, but not enough to really give the traction any significant challenges. But I know just up here, we have another particularly nice feature to show you. Another thing that this car comes with is a rear differential lock. Now, you might be asking yourself, why do I really need a rear diff lock on a four-wheel drive car? Surely there aren't that many circumstances I can get into where that's gonna be important. 
Well, ordinarily you're right, but if you're really going to use this car for what it's designed for, you are going to encounter some extremely challenging landscape. It's another one of those bends. <laughs> what do you think, Jonas? Oh, come on. No. <laughs> oh, poop. There we go. So let's have a look at this. What we're going to do at this point, just before I get out here, is that I'm going to see if Jonas wants to pop outside of the car with his camera so he can film this wheel going up in the air. Now, you will see then immediately exactly what the rear diff is delivering when it's locked. And Jonas is just taking a quick walk around to the back. And he's giving you a really good look at some of the torture that you can put your car through if you're gonna own a Hilux. Now, I think I can say honestly, I never really took mine into situations this challenging, but that is the whole point of a good off-road course. You really get to see how your car will behave when you do things to it that you ordinarily and hopefully will never have to encounter unless you're intentionally trying to. It really just tells you where the limits of your cars are. And we've driven a fair amount of cars round off road circuits exactly like this, it's very pleasing to see how well this one stands up to the challenge. Well, it's a Hilux, so, you know, that seems like an appropriate place to park in. Well, that about does it for us from just outside of Munich. But what do we think about this? Well, on its most basic level, you really have to ask yourself, do you need a pickup? They're hugely practical if what you need to do is go off road, tow a lot or fit lots of things in the back. But if not, you really should think about another car first. Now, that said, if a pickup is for you, there is a wide amount of choice. So why the Hilux? I still believe after all this time that it represents the most fun, the most practicality at the best value point. That's Toyota for you. It's well made and it's gonna last and last and last. Does that make it the best, most comfortable pickup out there? Well, I can think of a lot of different examples of pickups that are more refined. Let's be honest, whose interiors are a little bit nicer finished. What are we gonna be paying though? Well. The base model for this car starts at 25,000 euro. This one, the executive line, kicks in at around about a starting price of 45. I have to say, for me, a pickup is a utility vehicle, and because of that, I'm more about an entry level than a highly finished spec. Not least because once you get inside and start poking around, you really do have to ask just how much you're placing a value on the extra money that you just spent. The real nuts and bolts here are the engine and the towing capacity. This 2.4 litre diesel gives you more than enough grunt and a good enough pickup to live with this car around town and on the highway and at 3.2 tonnes of towing capacity, come on, it's gonna do anything else that you want. So, a little bit basic in terms of materials and finishing inside, but you know what, I don't care. When I'm driving it through a field or a river or a typhoon, I know what I trust and I know what I want to be driving. So for me, I'm still a Hilux guy at heart, but what do you think? I hope you've enjoyed watching. If you have any comments or questions, please pop them in the comments below. Please subscribe and we hope we'll see you again soon.